you ought to know that towns and fortresses can be strong either by nature or industry. Those are strong by nature which are surrounded by rivers or marshes, as is Mantua or Ferrara, or those situated on a rock or sloping mountain, as Monaco and San Leo. For those situated on mountains which are not difficult to climb, today are, with respect to caves and artillery, very weak. And therefore, very often today, a plain is sought on which to build a city, to make it strong by industry. The first industry is to make the walls twisted and full of turned recesses, which pattern results in the enemy not being able to approach them, as they will be able to be attacked easily not only from the front, but on the flanks. If the walls are made too high, they are excessively exposed to the blows of the artillery. If they are made too low, they are very easily scaled. If you dig ditches or moats in front of them to make it difficult to employ ladders, if it should happen that the enemy fills them, which a large army can do easily, the wall becomes prey to the enemy. I believe, therefore, subject to a better judgment, that if you want to make provision against both evils, the wall ought to be made high, with the ditches inside and not outside. This is the strongest way to build that is possible, for it protects you from artillery and ladders, and does not give the enemy the faculty of filling the ditches. The wall, therefore, ought to be as high as occurs to you, and not less than three arm lengths wide, to make it difficult to be ruined. It ought to have towers placed at intervals of two hundred arm lengths. The ditch inside ought to be at least thirty arm lengths wide and twelve deep, and all the earth that is excavated in making the ditch is thrown towards the city, and is sustained by a wall that is part of the base of the ditch, and extends again as much above the ground as that a man may take cover behind it, which has the effect of making the depth of the ditch greater. In the ditch, every two hundred arm lengths, there should be a matted enclosure, which, with the artillery, causes injury to anyone who should descend into it. The heavy artillery which defends the city are placed behind the wall enclosing the ditch, for to defend the wall from the front, as it is high, it is not possible to use conveniently anything other than the small or middle-sized guns. If the enemy comes to scale your wall, the height of the first wall easily protects you. If he comes with artillery, he must first batter down the first wall. But once it is battered down, because the nature of all batterings is to cause the wall to fall towards the battered side, the ruin of the wall will result, since it does not find a ditch which to receive and hide it, in doubling the depth of the ditch, so that it is not possible for you to pass on further, as you will find a ruin that holds you back and a ditch which will impede you and from the wall of the ditch, in safety, the enemy artillery kills you. The only remedy there exists for you is to fill up the ditch, which is very difficult, as much because its capacity is large, as from the difficulty you have in approaching it, since the walls, being winding and recessed, you can enter among them only with difficulty, for the reasons previously mentioned and then having to climb over the ruin with a material in hand causes you very great difficulty, so that I know a city so organised is completely indestructible. Batista said, If, in addition to the ditch inside, there should also be one on the outside, wouldn't the encampment be stronger? Fabrizio said, It would be without doubt, but my reasoning is that if you want to dig one ditch only, it is better inside than outside. Batista said, Would you have water in the ditch, or would you leave them dry? Fabrizio said, Opinions are different. For ditches full of water protect you from subterranean tunnels. The ditches without water make it more difficult for you to fill them in again. But considering everything, I would have them without water, for they are more secure. And as it has been observed that in winter time the ditches are ice over, the capture of a city is made easy, as happened at Mirandola when Pope Julius besieged it. And to protect yourself from tunnels, I would dig them so deep that whoever should want to tunnel deeper should find water. 
I would also build the fortresses in a way similar to the walls and ditches, so that similar difficulty would be encountered in destroying it. I want to call to mind one good thing to anyone who defends a city, and this is that they do not erect bastions outside, and they be distant from its wall. And another to anyone who builds the fortress, and this is that he not build any redoubts in them, into which whoever is inside can retire when the wall is lost. What makes me give the first counsel is that no one ought to do anything through the medium of which you begin to lose your reputation without any remedy, the loss of which makes others esteem you less, and dismay those who undertake your defence. And what I say will always happen to you if you erect bastions outside the town that you have to defend, for you will always lose them, as you are unable to defend small things when they are placed under the fury of the artillery, so that in losing them they become the beginning and the cause of your ruin. Genoa, when it rebelled from King Louis of France, erected some bastions on the hills outside the city, which, as soon as they were lost, and they were lost quickly, also caused the city to be lost. As to the second council, I affirm there is nothing more dangerous concerning a fortress than to be able to retire into it, for the hope that men have when they abandon a place cause it to be lost, and when it is lost, it then causes the entire fortress to be lost. For an example, there is the recent loss of the fortress of Forley, when the Countess Catherine defended it against Cesare Borgia, son of Pope Alexander the Sixth, who had led the army of the King of France. That entire fortress was full of places by both of them, for it was originally a citadel. There was a moat before coming to the fortress, so that it was entered by means of a drawbridge. The fortress was divided into three parts, and each part separated by a ditch, and with water between them, and one passed from one place to another by means of bridges, whence the duke battered one of those parts of the fortress with artillery, and opened up part of a wall, whence Monsignor Giovanni de Casali, who was in charge of the garrison, did not think of defending that opening, but abandoned to retire into the other places so that the force of the duke, having entered that part without opposition, immediately seized all of it, for they became masters of the bridges that connected the parts with each other. He lost the fort, which was held to be indestructible because of two mistakes, one because it had so many redoubts, the other because no one was made master of his bridges, they were unprotected. The poorly built fortress, and the little prudence of the defender, therefore, brought disgrace to the magnanimous enterprise of the Countess, who had the courage to face an army which neither the King of Naples nor the Duke of Milan had faced. And although the Duke's efforts did not have a good ending, none the less he became noted for those honours which his virtue merited, which was testified to by the many epigrams made in those times praising him. If I should therefore have to build a fortress, I would make its walls strong and ditches in the manner we have discussed, nor would I build anything else to live in but houses, and they be weak and low, so that they would not impede the sight of the walls to any one who might be in the plaza, so that the captain should be able to see with his own eyes where he could be of help, and that every one should understand that if the walls and the ditch were lost, the entire fortress would be lost. And even if I should build some redoubts, I would have the bridges so separated that each part should protect the bridge in its own area, arranging that it be buttressed on its pilasters in the middle of the ditch. And Batista said, You have said that today the little things cannot be defended, and it seems to me I have understood the opposite, that the smaller the thing was, the better it was defended. And Fabrizio said, You have not understood well, for today that place cannot be called strong where he who defends it does not have room to retire among new ditches and ramparts. For such is the fury of the artillery, that he who relies on protection of only one wall or rampart deceives himself. And as the bastions, if you want them not to exceed their regular measurements, for then they would be terraces and castles, are not made so that others can retire into them, they are lost quickly. And therefore it is wise practice to leave these bastions outside, and fortify the entrances of the terraces, 
and cover their gates with rivets, so that one does not go in or out of the gate in a straight line, and there is a ditch with a bridge over it from the rivet to the gate. The gates also are fortified with shutters, so as to allow your men to re-enter, when, after going out to fight, it happens that the enemy drives them back, and in the ensuing mixing of men the enemy does not enter with them. And therefore these things have also been found which the ancients called cataracts, which being let down keep out the enemy, but save one's friends. For in such cases one cannot avail himself of anything else, neither bridges or the gate, since both are occupied by the crowd. Batista said, I have seen these shutters that you mention, made of small beams, in Germany, in the form of iron grids, while those of ours are made entirely of massive planks. I would want to know whence this difference arises, and which is stronger. Fabrizio said, I will tell you again that the methods and organizations of war in all the world, with respect to those of the ancients, are extinct. But in Italy, they are entirely lost, and if there is something more powerful, it results from the examples of the Ultramontane. You may have heard, and these others can remember, how weakly things were built before King Charles of France crossed into Italy in the year 1494. The battlements were made a half arm length wide. The places for the crossbowmen and bombardiers were made with a small aperture outside and a large one inside, and with many other defects which I will omit not to be tedious, for the defences are easily taken away from slender battlements. The places for bombardiers built that way are easily opened and demolished. Now from the French we have learned to make the battlements wide and large, and also to make the places of bombardiers wide on the inside, and narrow at the centre of the wall, and then again widen it up on the outside edge, and this results in the artillery being able to demolish its defences only with difficulty. The French, moreover, have many other arrangements such as these, which, because they have not been seen thus, have not been given consideration. Among which is the method of the shutters made in the form of a grid, which is by far a better method than yours. For if you have to repair the shutters of a gate such as yours, lowering it if you are locked inside, and hence unable to injure the enemy, so that they can attack it safely either in the dark or with a fire, but if it is made in the shape of a grid, you can, once it is lowered, by those weaves and intervals to be able to defend it with lances, crossbows, and every other kind of arms. Battista said, I have also seen other ultramontane custom in Italy, and it is this, making the carriages of the artillery with the spokes of the wheels bent towards the axles. I would like to know why they make them this way, and it seems to me it will be stronger straight as those of our wheels. Fabrizio said, Never believe that things which differ from the ordinary are made at home, but if you would believe that I should make them such as to be more beautiful, you would err. For where strength is necessary, no account is taken of beauty, but they all arise from being safer and stronger than ours. The reason is this. When the carriage is loaded, it either goes on a level or inclined to the right or left side. When it goes level, the wheels equally sustain the weight, which, being divided equally between them, does not burden them much. When it inclines, it comes to have all the weight of the load upon that wheel on which it inclines. If its spokes are straight, they can easily collapse, since the wheel being inclined, the spokes also come to incline, and do not sustain the weight in a straight line. And thus, when the carriage rides level, and when they carry less weight, they come to be stronger. When the carriage rides inclined, and when they carry more weight, they are weaker. The contrary happens to the bent spokes of the French carriages, for when the carriage inclines to one side, it leans straight on them, since being ordinarily bent, they come to be more straight or vertical, and can sustain all the weight strongly. And when the carriage goes level, and the spokes are bent, they sustain half the weight. But let us return to our cities and fortresses. The French, for the greater security of their towns, and to enable them, during sieges, to put into and withdraw forces from them more easily, also employ, in addition to the things mentioned, another arrangement, 
of which I have not yet seen any example in Italy, and it is this, that they erect two pilasters at the outside point of a drawbridge, and upon each of them they balance a beam so that half of it comes over the bridge and the other half outside, and they join small beams to the part outside, which are woven together to form one beam to another in the shape of a grid, and on the inside they attach a chain to the end of each beam. When they want to close the bridge from the outside, therefore, they release the chains and allow all that gridded part to drop, which closes the bridge when it is lowered, and when they want to open it they pull on the chains and the gridded beams come to be raised, and they can be raised so that a man can pass under, but not a horse, and also so much that a horse with a man can pass under, and also can be closed entirely, for it is lowered and raised like a lace curtain. This arrangement is more secure than the shutters, for it can be impeded by the enemy so that it cannot come down only with difficulty, and it does not come down in a straight line like the shutters, which can be easily penetrated. Those who want to build a city, therefore, ought to have all the things mentioned installed. And, in addition, they should want at least one mile around the wall, where either farming or building would not be allowed, but should be open field, where no bushes, embankments, trees or houses should exist which would impede the vision, and which should be in the rear of a besieging enemy. It is to be noted that a town which has its ditches outside with its embankments higher than the ground is very weak for they provide a refuge for the enemy who assaults you, and does not impede him in attacking you, because they can easily be forced and opened, giving his artillery an emplacement. But let us pass into the town. I do not want to waste much time in showing you that, in addition to the things mentioned previously, provisions for living and fighting supplies must also be included, for they are the things which everyone needs and without them every other provision is in vain. And generally two things ought to be done, provision yourself, and deprive the enemy of the opportunity to avail himself of the resources of your country. Therefore any straw, grain, and cattle which you cannot receive into your house ought to be destroyed. Whoever defends a town ought to see to it that nothing is done in a tumultuous and disorganised manner, and have means to let every one know what he has to do in any incident. The manner is this, that the women, children, aged, and the public stay at home, and leave the town free to the young and the brave, who armed are distributed for defence, part being on the walls, part at the gates, part in the principal places of the city, in order to remedy those evils which might arise within. Another part is not assigned to any place, but is prepared to help any one requesting the help. And when matters are so organised, only with difficulty can tumults arise which disturb you. I want you to note also that in attacking and defending cities, nothing gives the enemy hope of being able to occupy a town than to know the inhabitants are not in the habit of looking for the enemy. For often cities are lost entirely from fear without any other action. When one assaults such a city, he should make all his appearances ostentatious and terrible. On the other hand, he who is assaulted ought to place brave men, who are not afraid of thoughts, but by arms, on the sides where the enemy comes to fight. For if the attempt proves vain, courage grows in the besieged, and then the enemy is forced to overcome those inside with his virtue and his reputation. The equipment with which the ancients defended the towns are many, such as ballistas, onagers, scorpions, arc ballistas, large bows and slingshots, and those with which they assaulted were also many, such as battering rams, wagons, hollow metal fuses, musculi, trench covers, brutei, siege machines, vinae, scythes, and turtles, somewhat similar to present-day tanks. In place of these things, today there is the artillery, which serves both attackers and defenders, and hence I will not speak further about it. But let us return to our discussion, 
and come to the details of the siege attack. One ought to take care not to be able to be taken by hunger, and not to be forced to capitulate by assaults. As to hunger, it has been said that it is necessary, before the siege arrives, to be well provided with food. But when it is lacking during a long siege, some extraordinary means of being provided by friends who want to save you have been observed to be employed, especially if a river runs in the middle of the besieged city, as were the Romans when their castle of Casalino was besieged by Hannibal, who, not being able to send them anything by way of the river, threw great quantities of nuts into it, which being carried by the river without being able to be impeded, fed the Casalinese for some time. Some, when they were besieged, in order to show the enemy they had grain left over, and to make them despair of being able to defeat them by hunger, have either thrown bread outside the walls, or have given a calf grain to eat, and then allowed it to be taken, so that when it was killed, and being found full of grain, gave signs of an abundance which they do not have. On the other hand, excellent captains have used various methods to infamish the enemy. Fabius allowed the companions to sow, so that they should lack that grain which they were sowing. Dionysius, when he was besieged at Reggio, feigned wanting to make an accord with them, and while it was being drawn, had himself provided with food, and then, when, by this method, had depleted them of grain, pressed them, and starved them. Alexander the Great, when he wanted to capture Leucadia, captured all the surrounding castles, and allowed the men from them to take refuge in the city, and thus, by adding a great multitude, he starved them. As to assaults, it has been said that one ought to guard against the first onrush, with which the Romans often occupied many towns, assaulting them all at once from every side, and they called it attacking the city by its crown. As did Scipio when he occupied New Carthage in Spain. If this onrush is withstood, then only with difficulty will you be overcome. And even if it should occur that the enemy has entered inside the city by having forced the walls, even the small terraces give you some remedy if they are not abandoned. For many armies have, once they have entered into a town, been repulsed or slain. The remedy is that the townspeople keep themselves in high places, and fight them from their houses and towers. Which thing those who have entered in the city have endeavoured to win in two ways? The one, to open the gates of the city, and make a way for the townspeople by which they can escape in safety the other to send out a message by voice, signifying that no one would be harmed unless armed, and whoever would throw his arms on the ground, they would pardon. Which thing has made the winning of many cities easy? In addition to this, cities are easy to capture if you fall on them unexpectedly, which you can do when you find yourself with your army far away, so that they do not believe that you either want to assault them, or that you can do it without your presenting yourself because of the distance from the place. Whence, if you assault them secretly and quickly, it will almost always happen that you will succeed in reporting the victory. I unwillingly discuss those things which have happened in our times, as I would burden you with myself and my ideas, and I would not know what to say in discussing other things. Nonetheless, concerning this matter, I cannot but cite the example of Cesare Borgia, called Duke Valentine, who, when he was at Nocera with his forces, under the pretext of going to harm Camerino, turned towards the state of Urbino, and occupied a state in one day, and without effort, which some other, with great time and expense, would barely have occupied. Those who are besieged must also guard themselves from the deceit and cunning of the enemy and therefore the besieged should not trust anything which they see the enemy doing continuously, but always believe they are being done by deceit, and can change to injure them. When Domitus Calvinus was besieging a town, he undertook habitually to circle the walls of the city every day with a good part of his forces. Whence the townspeople, believing he was doing this for exercise, lightened the guard. When Domitius became aware of this, he assaulted them and destroyed them. Some captains, when they heard beforehand that aid was coming to the besieged, 
have clothed their soldiers with the insignia of those who were to come, and having introduced them inside, have occupied the town. Cimon the Athenian one night set fire to a temple that was outside the town, whence, when the townspeople arrived to succour it, they left the town to the enemy to plunder. Some have put to death those who left the besieged castle to blacksmith or shoe horses, and redressing their soldiers with the clothes of the blacksmiths, who then surrendered the town to him. The ancient captains also employed various methods to despoil the garrisons of the towns they wanted to take. Scipio, when he was in Africa, and desiring to occupy several castles in which garrisons had been placed by Carthaginians, feigned several times wanting to assault them, but then from fear not only abstained, but drew away from them. Which Hannibal believing to be true, in order to pursue him with a larger force and be able to attack him more easily, withdrew all the garrisons from them, and Scipio becoming aware of this, sent Maximus, his captain, to capture them. Pyrrhus, when he was waging war in Sclavonia, in one of the chief cities of that country, where a large force had been brought in to garrison it, feigned to be desperate of being able to capture it, and turning to other places, caused her, in order to succour them, to empty herself of the garrison, so that it became easy to be captured. Many have polluted the water and diverted rivers to take a town, even though they did not then succeed. Sieges and surrenders are also easily accomplished by dismaying them, by pointing out an accomplished victory, or new help which has come to their disfavour. The ancient captains sought to occupy towns by treachery, corrupting some inside, but have used different methods. Some have sent one of their men under the disguise of a fugitive, who gained authority and confidence with the enemy, which he afterwards used for his own benefit. Many, by this means, have learned the procedures of the guards, and through this knowledge have taken the town. Some have blocked the gate, so that it could not be locked, with a cart or a beam under some pretext, and by this means made the entry easy to the enemy. Hannibal persuaded one to give him a castle of the Romans, and that he should feign going on a hunt at night, to show his inability to go by day for fear of the enemy, and when he returned with the game, placed his men inside with it, and killing the guard, captured the gate. You also deceive the besieged by drawing them outside the town and distant from it, by feigning flight when they assault you. And many, among whom was Hannibal, have in addition allowed their quarters to be taken, in order to have the opportunity of placing them in their midst, and take the town from them. They deceive also by feigning departure, as did Formanus the Athenian, who having plundered the country of the Chalcidians, afterwards received their ambassadors, and filled their city with promises of safety and goodwill, who, as men of little caution, were shortly after captured by Formanus. The besieged ought to look out for men whom they have among them that are suspect, but sometimes they may want to assure themselves of these by reward, as well as by punishment. Marcellus, recognising that Lucius Bancius Nolanus had turned to favour Hannibal, employed so much humanity and liberality towards him, that from an enemy he made him a very good friend. The besieged ought to use more diligence in their guards when the enemy is distant than when he is near, and they ought to guard those places better which they think can be attacked less for many towns have been lost when the enemy assaulted them on a side from which they did not believe they would be assaulted. And this deception occurs for two reasons, either because the place is strong and they believe it to be inaccessible, or because the enemy cunningly assaults him on one side with feigned uproars, and on the other silently with the real assaults. And therefore the besieged ought to have a great awareness of this and above all, at all times, but especially at night, have good guards at the walls, and place there not only men but dogs, and keep them ferocious and ready, which by smell detect the presence of the enemy, and with their baying discover him. And in addition to dogs, it has been found that geese have also saved a city, as happened to the Romans when the Gauls besieged the capital. When Athens was besieged by the Spartans, Alcibiades, in order to see if the guards were awake, 
arranged that when a light was raised at night, all the guards should rise, and inflicted a penalty on those who did not observe it. Hisicratus, the Athenian, slew a guard who was sleeping, saying he was leaving him as he found him. Those who were besieged have had various ways of sending news to their friends, and in order not to send embassies by voice, wrote letters in cipher, and concealed them in various ways. The ciphers are according to the desire of whoever arranges them. The method of concealment is varied. Some have written inside the scabbard of a sword. Others have put these letters inside raw bread, and then baked it, and gave it as food for him who brought it. Others have placed them in the most secret places of the body. Others have put them in the collar of a dog, known to him who brings it. Others have written ordinary things in a letter, and then have written with invisible ink between one line and another, which afterwards, by wetting or scalding, caused the letters to appear. This method has been very astutely observed in our time, where some, wanting to point out a thing which was to be kept secret to their friends, who lived inside a town, and not wanting to trust it in person, sent communications written in the customary manner, but interlined, as I mentioned above, and had them hung at the gates of a temple, which were then taken and read by those who recognised them from the countersigns they knew. Which is a very cautious method, because whoever brings it can be deceived by you, and you do not run any danger. There are infinite other ways by which any one by himself likewise can find and read them. But one writes with more facility to the besieged than the besieged do to friends outside for the latter cannot send out such letters except by one who leaves the town under the guise of a fugitive, which is a doubtful and dangerous exploit when the enemy is cautious to a point. But as to those that are sent inside, he who is sent can, under many pretexts, go into the camp that is besieged, and from here await a convenient opportunity to jump into the town. But let us come to talk of present captures. And I say that, if they occur when you are being fought in your city which is not arranged with ditches inside, as we pointed out a little while ago, when you do not want the enemy to enter by the breaks in the wall made by artillery, as there is no remedy for the break which it makes, it is necessary for you, while the artillery is battering, to dig a ditch inside the wall that is being hit, at least thirty arm lengths wide, and throw all the earth that is excavated towards the town which makes embankments, and the ditch, deeper. And you must do this quickly, so that if the wall falls, the ditch will be excavated at least five or six arm lengths deep. While this ditch is being excavated, it is necessary that it be closed on each side by a blockhouse. And if the wall is so strong that it gives you time to dig the ditches, and erect the blockhouses, that part which is battered comes to be stronger than the rest of the city for such a repair comes to have the form that we gave to inside ditches. But if the wall is weak and does not give you time, then there is need to show virtue, and oppose them with armed forces, and with all your strength. This method of repair was observed by the Pisans when he went to besiege them, and they were able to do this because they had strong walls which gave them time, and the ground firm and most suitable for erecting ramparts and making repairs which, had they not had this benefit, would have been lost. It would always be prudent, therefore, first to prepare yourself, digging the ditches inside your city and throughout all the circuit, as we devised a little while ago, for in this case, as the defences have been made, the enemy is waited with leisure and safety. The ancients often occupied towns with tunnels in two ways either they dug a secret tunnel which came out inside the town, and through which they entered it, in the way in which the Romans took the city of Vienti, or by tunnelling they undermined a wall, and caused it to be ruined. This last method is more effective today, and causes cities located high up to be weaker, for they can be undermined more easily, and then when the powder which ignites in an instant is placed inside those tunnels, it not only ruins the wall, but the mountains are opened, and the fortresses are entirely disintegrated into several parts. The remedy for this is to build on a plain, 
and make the ditch which girds your city so deep that the enemy cannot excavate further below it without finding water, which is the only enemy of these excavations. And even if you find a knoll within the town that you defend, you cannot remedy it otherwise than to dig many deep wells within your walls, which are as outlets to those excavations which the enemy might be able to arrange against it. Another remedy is to make an excavation opposite to where you learn he is excavating, which method readily impedes him, but is very difficult to foresee when you are besieged by a cautious enemy. Whoever is besieged, above all, ought to take care not to be attacked in times of repose, as, after having engaged in battle, after having stood guard, that is, at dawn, the evening between night and day, and, above all, at dinner-time, in which times many towns have been captured, many armies ruined by those inside. One ought, therefore, to be always on guard with diligence on every side, and in good part well armed. I do not want to miss telling you that what makes defending a city or an encampment difficult is to have to keep all the forces you have in them disunited. For the enemy, being able altogether to assault you at his discretion, you must keep every place guarded on all sides, and thus he assaults you with his entire force, and you defend it with part of yours. The besieged can also be completely overcome while those outside cannot and less repulsed. Whence many who have been besieged, either in their encampment or in a town, although inferior in strength, have suddenly issued forth with all their forces, and have overcome the enemy. Marcellus did this at Nola, and Caesar did this in Gaul, when his encampment, being assaulted by the great number of Gauls, and seeing he could not defend it without having to divide these forces into several parts, and unable to stay within the stockade with the driving attack of the enemy, opened the encampment on one side, and turning to that side with all his forces, attacked them with such fury and with such virtue that he overcame and defeated them. The constancy of the besieged has also often displeased and dismayed the besieger, and when Pompey was affronting Caesar, and Caesar's army was suffering greatly from hunger, some of his bread was brought to Pompey who, seeing it made of grass, commanded it not to be shown to his army, in order not to frighten it, seeing what kind of enemies he had to encounter. Nothing gave the Romans more honour in the war against Hannibal as their constancy, for, in whatever more inimical and adverse fortune, they never asked for peace, and never gave any sign for fear. Rather, when Hannibal was around Rome, those fields on which he had situated his quarters were sold at a higher price than they would ordinarily have been sold in other times. And they were so obstinate in their enterprise, that to defend Rome they did not leave off attacking Capua, which was being besieged by the Romans at the same time Rome was being besieged. I know that I have spoken to you of many things, which you have been able to understand and consider by yourselves, and nonetheless I have done this as I also told you to-day, to be able to show you, through them, the better kind of training, and also to satisfy those, if there should be any, who had not had the opportunity to learn, as you have. Nor does it appear to me there is anything left for me to tell you, other than some general rules, with which you should be very familiar, which are these. What benefits the enemy harms you, and what benefits you harms the enemy. Whoever is more vigilant in observing the designs of the enemy in war, and ensures much hardship in training his army, will incur fewer dangers, and can have greater hope for victory. Never lead your soldiers into an engagement, unless you are assured of their courage, know they are without fear, and are organised, and never make an attempt unless you see they hope for victory. It is better to defeat the enemy by hunger than with steel. In such victory fortune counts more than virtue. No proceeding is better than that which you have concealed from the enemy until the time you have executed it. To know how to recognise an opportunity in war and take it benefits you more than anything else. 
Nature creates a few men brave. Industry and training makes many. Discipline in war counts for more than fury. If some on the side of the enemy desert to come to your service, if they be loyal, they will always make you a great acquisition. For the forces of the adversary diminish more with the loss of those who flee than those who are killed, even though the name of the fugitives is suspect to the new friends and odious to the old. It is better in organising an engagement to reserve great aid behind the front line than to spread out your soldiers to make a greater front. He is overcome with difficulty who knows how to recognise his forces and those of the enemy. The virtue of the soldiers is worth more than a multitude, and the sight is often of more benefit than virtue. New and speedy things frighten armies, while the customary and slow things are esteemed little by them. You will therefore make your army experienced, and learn the strength of a new enemy by skirmishes before you come to an engagement with him. Whoever pursues a routed enemy in a disorganised manner does nothing but become vanquished from having been a victor. Whoever does not make provisions necessary to live or eat is overcome without steel. Whoever trusts more in cavalry than in infantry, or more in infantry than in cavalry, must settle for the location. If you want to see whether any spy has come into the camp during the day, have no one go to his quarters. Change your proceeding when you become aware that the enemy has foreseen it. Counsel with many on the things you ought to do, and confer with few on what you do afterwards. When soldiers are confined to their quarters, they are kept there by fear or punishment. Then, when they are led by war, they are led by hope and reward. Good captains never come to an engagement unless necessity compels them, or the opportunity calls them. Act so your enemies do not know how you want to organise your army for battle, and in whatever way you organise them, arrange it so that the first line can be received by the second and by the third. In a battle, never use a company for some other purpose than what you have assigned it to, unless you want to cause disorder. Accidents are remedied with difficulty unless you quickly take the facility of thinking. Men, steel, money, and bread are the sinews of war, but of these four the first two are more necessary, for men and steel can find money and bread, but money and bread do not find men and steel. The unarmed rich man is the prize of the poor soldier. Accustom your soldiers to despise delicate living and luxurious clothing. This is as much as occurs to me generally to remind you, and I know I could have told you of many other things in my discussion, for example, how and in how many ways the ancients organised their ranks, how they dressed, and how they trained in many other things, and to give you many other particulars which I have not judged necessary to narrate, as much because you are able to see them, as because my intention has not been to show you in detail how the ancient army was created, but how an army should be organised in these times, which should have more virtue than they now have. Whence it does not please me to discuss the ancient matters further than those I have judged necessary to such an introduction. I know I should have enlarged more on the cavalry, and also on naval warfare, for whoever defines the military says that it is an army on land and on the sea, on foot and on horseback. Of naval matters I will not presume to talk, not because of not being informed, but because I should leave the talk to the Genoese and Venetians, who have made much study of it, and have done great things in the past. Of the cavalry I also do not want to say anything other than what I have said above, this part being, as I said, less corrupted. In addition to this, if the infantry, with the nerve of the army, are well organised, of necessity it happens that good cavalry be created. I would only remind you that whoever organises the military in his country, so as to fill the quota of cavalry, should make two provisions. The one, that he should distribute horses of good breed throughout his countryside, 
and accustom his men to make a round-up of fillies, as you do in this country with calves and mules. The other, so that the round-up men find a buyer, I would prohibit any one to keep mules who did not keep a horse, so that whoever wanted to keep a mount only would be constrained to keep a horse. And, in addition, none should be able to dress in silk, except whoever keeps a horse. I understand this arrangement has been done by some princes of our times, and to have resulted in an excellent cavalry being produced in their countries in very brief time. About other things, how much should be expected from the cavalry, I will go back to what I have said to you to-day, and to that which is the custom. Perhaps you will also desire to learn what parts a captain ought to have. In this I will satisfy you in a brief manner, for I would not knowingly select any other man than one who should know how to do all those things we have discussed to-day, and these would still not be enough for him if he did not know how to find them out by himself, for no one without imagination was ever very great in his profession, and if imagination makes for honour in other things, it will, above all, honour you in this one. And it is to be observed that every creation, even though minor, is celebrated by the writers, as is seen where they praised Alexander the Great, who, in order to break camp more secretly, did not give the signal with the trumpet, but with a hat on the end of a lance. He is also praised for having ordered his soldiers, when coming to battle with the enemy, to kneel with the left knee, so that they could more strongly withstand the attack of the enemy, which not only gave him victory, but also so much praise that all the statues erected in his honour show him in that pose. But as it is time to finish this discussion, I want to return to the subject, and so in part escape that penalty which in this town custom decrees for those who do not return. If you remember well, Cosimo, you said to me that I was, on the one hand, an exalter of antiquity, and a censurer of those who do not imitate them in serious matters, and, on the other hand, in matters of war, in which I worked very hard, I did not imitate them. You were unable to discover the reason. To that I replied that men who want to do something must first prepare themselves to know how to do it, in order to be able afterwards to do it when the occasion permits it. Whether or not I would know how to bring the army to the ancient ways, I would rather you be the judge, who have heard me discuss on this subject at length. Whence you have been able to know how much time I have consumed on these thoughts, and I also believe you should be able to imagine how much desire there is in me to put them into effect. Which you can guess, if I was ever able to do it, or if ever the opportunity was given to me. Yet to make you more certain, and for my greater justification, I would like also to cite you the reasons, and in part will observe what I promised you, to show you the ease and the difficulty that are present in such imitation. I say to you, therefore, that no activity among men to-day is easier to restore to its ancient ways than the military. But for those only who are princes of so large a state, they are able to assemble fifteen or twenty thousand young men from their subjects. On the other hand, Nothing is more difficult than this to those who do not have such a convenience. And because I want you to understand this part better, you have to know that captains praised are of two kinds. The one includes those who, with an army well ordered through its own natural discipline, have done great things, such as with the greater part of the Roman citizens, and others, who have led armies who have not had any hardship in maintaining them good, and to see to it they were safely led. The other includes those who not only had to overcome the enemy, but before they came to this, had been compelled to make their army good and well ordered, and who, without doubt, deserve greater praise than those others merited, who, with an army which was naturally good, have acted with so much virtue. Such as these were Pelopidas, Epaminondas, Tullus Hostilius, Philip of Macedonia, father of Alexander, and Cyrus king of the Persians, and Gracchus the Roman. All these had first to make the army good, and then fight with it. All of these were able to do so, as much by their prudence as by having subjects capable of being directed in such practices. 
nor would it have been possible for any of them to accomplish any praiseworthy deed, no matter how good and excellent they might have been, should they have been in an alien country, full of corrupt men and not accustomed to sincere obedience. It is not enough, therefore, in Italy, to govern an army already trained, but it is necessary first to know how to do it, and then how to command it. And of these there need to be those princes, who, because they have a large state and many subjects, have the opportunity to accomplish this. Of whom I cannot be one, for I have never commanded, nor can I command except armies of foreigners, and men obligated to others, and not to me. Whether or not it is possible to introduce into those princes some of the things we discuss today, I want to leave to your judgment. Would I make one of those soldiers who practice today carry more arms than is customary, and in addition food for two or three days and a shovel? Should I make him dig, or keep many hours every day under arms in feigned exercises, so that in real battles afterwards he would be of value to me? Would they abstain from gambling, lasciviousness, swearing and insolence, which they do daily? Would they be brought to so much discipline, obedience and respect, that a tree full of apples, which should be found in the midst of an encampment, would be left intact, as is read happened many times in the ancient armies? What can I promise them, by which they will respect, love or fear me, when, with a war ended, they no longer must come to me for anything? Of what can I make them ashamed, who are born and brought up without shame? By what deity or saints do I make them take an oath? By those they adore, or by those they curse? I do not know any whom they adore, but I well know that they curse them all. How can I believe they will observe the promises to those men for whom they show their contempt hourly? How can those who depreciate God have reverence for men? What good customs, therefore, is it possible to instil in such people? And if you should tell me the Swiss and the Spaniards are good, I should confess they are far better than the Italians. But if you will note my discussion, and the ways in which both proceed, you will see that there are still many things among the Swiss and Spaniards to bring them up to the perfection of the ancients. And the Swiss have been good from their natural customs, for the reasons I have told you today, and the Spaniards from necessity. For when they fight in a foreign country, it seems to them they are constrained to win or die, and as no place appeared to them where they might flee, they became good. But it is a goodness defective in many parts, for there is nothing good in them except that they are accustomed to wait the enemy up to the point of the pike and of the sword. Nor would there be any one suitable to teach them what they lack, and much less any one who does not speak their language. But let us turn to the Italians, who, because they have not wise princes, have not produced any good army, and because they did not have the necessity that the Spaniards had, have not undertaken it by themselves, so that they remain the shame of the world. And the people are not to blame, but their princes are, who have been castigated, and by their ignorance have received a just punishment, ignominiously losing the state, and without any show of virtue. Do you want to see if what I tell you is true? Consider how many wars have been waged in Italy from the passage of King Charles of France until today. And wars usually make men warlike and acquire reputations. These, as much as they have been great and cruel, so much more have caused its members and its leaders to lose reputation. This necessarily points out that the customary orders were not and are not good and there is no one who knows how to take up the new orders. Nor do you ever believe that reputation will be acquired by Italian arms except in the manner I have shown, and by those who have large states in Italy, for this custom can be instilled in men who are simple, rough, and your own, but not to men who are malignant, have bad habits, and are foreigners. And a good sculptor will never be found who believes he can make a beautiful statue from a piece of poorly shaped marble, even though it may be a rough one. Our Italian princes, before they tasted the blows of the Ultramontane Wars, believed it was enough for them to know what was written, think of a cautious reply, or write a beautiful letter, 
show wit and promptness in his sayings and in his words, know how to weave a deception, ornament himself with gems and gold, sleep and eat with greater splendour than others, keep many lascivious persons around, conduct himself avariciously and haughtily towards his subjects, become rotten with idleness, hand out military ranks at his will, express contempt for any one who may have demonstrated any praiseworthy manner, want their words should be the responses of oracles. Nor were these little men aware that they were preparing themselves to be the prey of any one who assaulted them. From this, then, in the year 1494, there arose the great frights, the sudden flights, and the miraculous losses, and those most powerful states of Italy were several times sacked and despoiled in this manner. But what is worse is that those who remained persist in the same error, and exist in the same disorder, and they do not consider that those who held the state anciently had done all those things we discussed, and that they concentrated on preparing the body for hardships, and the mind not to be afraid of danger. Whence it happened that Caesar, Alexander, and all those excellent men and princes were first among the combatants, went around on foot, and even if they did lose their state, wanted also to lose their lives so that they lived and died with virtue. And if they, or part of them, could be accused of having too much ambition to rule, there never could be found in them any softness or anything to condemn which makes men delicate and cowardly. If these things were to be read and believed by these princes, it would be impossible that they would not change their way of living, and their countries not change in fortune. And as, in the beginning of our discussion, you complained of your organisation, I tell you, if you had organised it as we discussed above, and it did not give a good account for itself, then you would have reason to complain. But if it is not organised and trained, as I have said, the army can have reason to complain of you, who have made an abortion and not a perfect organisation. The Venetians also, and the Duke of Ferrara, began it, but did not pursue it which was due to their fault, and not of their men. And I affirm to now that any of them who have states in Italy to-day will begin in this way. He will be the lord higher than any other in this province. And it will happen to his state as happened to the kingdom of the Macedonians, which, coming under Philip, who had learned the manner of organising the armies from Epaminondas, the Theban, became with these arrangements and practices, while the rest of Greece was in idleness and attending to reciting comedies, so powerful that in a few years he was able to occupy it completely, and leave such a foundation to his son that he was able to make himself prince of the entire world. Whoever disparages these thoughts, therefore, if he be a prince, disparages his principality, and if he be a citizen, his city. And I complain of nature, which either ought to make me a recogniser of this, or ought to have given me the faculty of being able to pursue it. Nor, even to-day, when I am old, do I think I have the opportunity. And because of this, I have been liberal with you, who, being young and qualified, when the things I have said please you, could, at the proper time, in favour of your princes, aid and counsel them. I do not want you to be afraid or mistrustful of this because this country appears to be destined to resuscitate the things that are dead, as has been observed with poetry, painting, and sculpture. But as for waiting for me, because of my years, do not rely on it, and truly, if in the past fortune had conceded to me what would have sufficed for such an enterprise, I believe I would, in a very brief time, have shown the world how much the ancient institutions were of value, and without doubt, I would have enlarged it with glory, or would have lost it without shame. End of the Art of War by Niccolo Machiavelli Read by Clive Catterall